Hello and welcome to my show and series on communication. I'm talking about communication because I think that that's the most important thing in terms of humanity living together. I will say that communication is not the panacea to all problems, but it can help us to solve problems. Uh, my name is Dr. Marquita Bird. I am a uh, emeritus uh, professor of San Jose State University, which means I'm retired. Uh, but I wanted to extend my teaching out from the classroom, out from the ivory, t ivory tower to the community. And these are kind of general topics about communication. I'm hoping that you'll come to understand, number one, the importance of uh, ethical communication. And two, I'm hoping that you will acquire knowledge and skills to be ethical in all communication. That is not an easy thing. That's kind of difficult because ethics are things... Uh, that uh, people don't talk about very often. When I was in grade school, we used to have a, co a class called Civics. And uh, we would talk, we'd spend some maybe 15 minutes in the morning talking about how to treat each other, how to talk to each other, how to be good citizens, how to help our community. Wow, did that make a difference? We don't have those discussions anymore. So I wanted to talk about ethics today. Now we hear the term ethics or ethical occasionally, but most of us haven't had a fruitful conversation about the ethics in communication or the ethical dimensions of interpersonal relationships. And because we don't talk about them, uh, then we actually don't know them. Uh, communication that is unethical, it can bring harm to an individual. Uh, it can bring harm to a situation. It can hurt us in general. Uh, the one thing that I advocate whenever I teach about communication is to be principled. We have to know what the principles are. So one of the activities I have students do is to write down their own philosophy of communication. Not somebody else's, not what you read in a book, but what are your guidelines for effective communication? What are your guidelines for uh, being moral and good in your communication? We all need to do that, so I'm hoping that maybe you'll do that today. We may think... Uh, that the school should teach it. And we get that all the time. I'm a teacher and I'm very sensitive to that. Well, they need to teach that at school. Everything that the students learn, they need to teach that at school. But here's what Judge Judah Shinlin said. She said, you don't teach morals and ethics and empathy and kindness in schools. You teach them at home and children learn by example. Isn't that something? So we want to know why is bullying going on? Why are children hurting each other? Because we're not teaching them that that's not the way to do it. And one of my other lectures we talk about not teaching them emotional literacy. So ethics, let me point out, are different from laws. People always say, how are they different? In that ethics are not written anywhere most of the time. The only time you'll see ethics written somewhere is in a profession. For example, you may have ethics uh, for doctors, Hippocratic Oath. You'll have ethics for journalism. Uh, those sorts of things, Eth ethics for performance, uh, but mostly in interpersonal relationship, we don't have anything written down, and therefore it's very difficult to understand what the ethics are, and it's difficult to change them, whereas laws are ethics that have been codified. Codified may be your word for your vocabulary today. It simply means that these ethics have been written and systematized and um, made into law. That's where uh, our laws come from. And we can read about them and change them. So it's m more easy to understand laws than it is to understand ethics. But we can come to better understandings through our communication. Now let's get a definition of ethics. Ethics is the study of values and morals of a culture or a society. We do know that people develop their own ethical standards. But in order to fit in society, they need to understand the ethics of the society. Not that you have to be exactly like everybody else, but you do need to know the rules of communication. Morals have to do with the right and wrong of a situation. They have to do with the good and the bad of a situation. And we need to develop those to reduce the friction and harm of living in an aggregate. You know, human beings, uh, we used to be few. We'd be in a you know, village or settlement where there'd just be a few people. Now, for example, I live in a community where there's over a million people. A million people. How do we keep from harming each other? 
How do we help to grow our potential? We do it through communication ethics. And we are losing those because we don't teach them in the family. Uh, and I even tell my students, even if you're living alone in the forest, you got to have ethics. you got to understand the guidelines for treating the animals, for treating the plants, for treating the land. If you don't, you're going to die out in the forest by itself. So we have ethics everywhere. Now, every society, my first idea is that every society develops ethical guidelines for our communication. Most often, they're not written, but we have them. And people may say, well, where do we get these ethics from? Let's go way back uh, when men first came out of the cave. Uh, trial and error, that's where we got ethics from. We tried things, we saw behaviors, humans did. They realized, oh, that's not good. That hurt somebody. Or this works. And so as we came along in the evolution, we developed ethics. How do we live together and work together? So now we have ethics ourselves. Ethics are simply guidelines for behavior and speaking. Let me give you an example. Let's say uh, you're in a village, uh, or you're in a settlement, and the people from the next settlement come over and kill a lot of people in your community. Now, we've learned from experience that if we go over and kill all of them, that hurts our society in general. It hurts us in general. So we've learned not to do that, basically. So we have these guidelines for behavior. Uh, often, they are written first in our spiritual books. And I've learned from comparative religion that all major religions have the same basic principles about communicating. Uh, all major philosophies have come to understand the basic principles of effective or ethical communication. So they're often codified in our religious books. For example, uh, if you're reading uh, the Buddha, he has something called the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. And one of them, number three, is correct communication. And the Buddha said, correct speech means refraining from verbal misdeeds, such as lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, and senseless speech. And we see that in our Bible. We see it in the Quran. Uh, we see it in various other, the Bhagavad Gita, other uh, religious texts from every culture. Uh, ethics change from culture to culture because they come from the people, but as I said, the basic truths of life and humanity, all of the greatest philosophers and uh, the religious texts reflect that. So ethics are very, very important, just as the understanding of communication is. Now, very often people are surprised when I talk about the fact that we have to have ethical guidelines toward ourselves. We always start out talking about what are our ethics in terms of communicating with other people. But first, we have to have uh, ethical guidelines for ourselves in order that we may survive, in order that we may function, uh, in order that we may create good communication environments. One semester, uh, at the beginning of the semester, I came into class and I had this, you know, little uh, jewelry set that I bought from, you know, uh, TGNY, and um, uh, if you don't, you're young, you don't know what that is. I bought it from Walmart. That's I liked it. So I walked into class, and I had this what looked like a wedding set, and the students, some of them were my former students. Oh, Dr. Bird, did you get married? We see that, you know, that big diamond on your hand. You know, did you? What did you do? Who did you get married to? And I wasn't expecting that response. I had to sit there and think a lot, and I said to them. I got married to myself. I committed me to me. And you commit yourself to yourself. So we're talking about committing ourselves to ourselves in order that we treat ourselves in ethical ways. Uh, uh, we talked about care of our physical self. Let's go on to talk about we have to be ethical to ourselves by refraining from associating with people who diminish our self-concept or our self-esteem. You have a responsibility to protect yourself emotionally, psychologically, physically by not staying in relationship with people who diminish you. I had a student last semester who was saying, oh, you know, I hang out with my boyfriend's friends and I hang out with him. And they sometimes uh, say bad things about my culture or they say negative things about me. 
And I said, well, does your boyfriend do that? She said, yes. I said, well, you need to break up with him. I said, I love you more than he loves you. I would never do that to you. You have a responsibility to move away from that because you are allowing yourself to be damaged. The key is to remember you only have one self, only one self. And sometimes a damage cannot be undone. So you have to protect your emotions. You have to protect yourself. And you don't hang out with people who diminish your selfish concept or your self-esteem. That's a, unethical. Uh, let's go on to you have a responsibility to reserve your time and energy for your own mental and physical uh, self. That's called self-care. How do you engage in self-care? Again, coming to the point where you only have one self, and if you don't take care of yourself in an ethical manner, you will become uh, unable to function. You may become unable to take care of yourself. So um, you reserve time for yourself every day to be by yourself. It's just 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, I myself uh, require a lot of time by myself. Uh, so I may spend three or four hours. Uh, and when you're doing that, you're not on the phone. You're not watching TV. You may be listening to music. You're not on the game. You are sitting there uh, communing with yourself. That's an ethical guideline that we all need to take because if you don't know yourself, you will be blown here and far by everybody else. Uh, D, terminate relationships. You have an ethical responsibility to terminate any relationship where you are being abused. You are being abused emotionally, physically, psychologically, financially. You have an ethical responsibility to terminate those relationships. Sometimes we're in family. Sometimes we have parents who do uh, 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 abuse us in many ways. But as soon as you can get away from them, you do that. Because, again, your mind is a terrible thing to waste. And if you allow people to abuse you, uh, then you are cutting your potential. Lastly, here's the really important part. Empower yourself to maintain your needs. Don't depend on the power of someone else. You take responsibility. For example, when I came to a new job at a university once, um, as soon as I got settled in, I had a lot, uh, several young women, even a couple of faculty and staff members, who were all women of color, who came to my office, either together or individually, and said, you know, uh, Professor X is uh, being abusive that he's being appropriate sexually uh, with students in the class. And, uh, well, can you do something about that? And my answer was, no. Well, first I asked, what did you do about it? Did you tell him you didn't want him to do that? Did you report it to the proper authorities? Uh, if you didn't, then no. Don't empower me to speak for you. You empower yourself to speak for you. And so often we have people say, well, uh, she did this to me or he did that to me, but you never spoke to them. You must empower yourself to maintain your needs. Let's go to point three. Now, we talked about being ethical with yourself. That's the first thing. The next thing is these things you keep in mind when you are communicating with other people. The first thing is check out your message. Exactly what are you saying to that person? Because uh, ultimately it can have a positive or negative consequences. What are you saying? When you tell a child, for example, oh, you're never going to grow up to be anything. My high school teacher said uh, in English class, all my color students get C's. That was unethical. That was an unethical message. You don't tell students things like that. You don't tell your children that. You don't tell your spouse that. You don't tell the people you work with that. What is the message? B, how are you saying it? Um, we're talking about paralinguistics. Do you say it in a mean way? Do you shout at people? Do you use irony? Do you use sarcasm? Those are all tones of talking to people. And how are you saying that message? Uh, I had a young lady once who was, this is a true story, was sitting on the curb. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the, she was sitting on the, on the concrete in a curb in my uh, community. And so people would come around that curb and might not see her and run over her. So I, I saw her one day. I had never seen her. And I saw her one day and I thought, oh, my God, she's in trouble. So other neighbors said, well, we told her to not do that. And she keeps doing it. I went out and said, baby, is there something wrong? Do you need help? I'm afraid for your safety. 
And when you sit here on the ground, there's a possibility that you could get run over, and I'm really afraid for you. I said it in a loving tone, as though I was her grandmother or auntie. Uh, I didn't derive her and say, oh, you're stupid. Uh, and she got up. She actually got up, and she never did that again. How you talk to people is important. The motive. Why are you saying what you're saying? Are you doing it to hurt? Are you doing it to help? Are you doing it to uh, clear your conscience? Uh, why are you doing these things? So I always look at your motive. I once told my son he had to change his clothes because they didn't look as I thought he should to go out on a school project. He was 15 years old, and um, he came out in these clothes. And I thought, oh, God, no, he can't do that. So I told him to go and change his clothes. He did that. But when he came out, he said to me, here's where I teach my children to speak for themselves. He said, Mama, this is not me anymore. This is who I was in Missouri. This is not who I am now. Well, I had to sit down and think, why did I tell him to change his clothes? Well, I told him to change his clothes because I didn't want anybody to think that me as mother uh, didn't dress my child well. But I had to remember he's 15. And he has a right to put on his clothes as long as they're not indecent. So I said, you're right, I apologize, go change your clothes. He did, and he was able to go to school, get on the bus. Why are you saying it? Who are you talking to? Uh, who are you talking to is important. Uh, are you talking to a loved one? Are you talking to somebody anywhere? You have to always be ethical. Who are you talking to? Um, and you need to go on then to talk about consequences. When you're talking to people, understand or at least try to think through what the consequences might be of what you're saying. And I'll give you this example. You know, throughout the world in the 1500s, 1600s, uh, European people uh, went around the world, they say, to proselytize, to talk to people about Christianity. Uh, and they thought that was a good thing. Everybody would think that's a good thing. But while they talked about Christianity, they also destroyed the culture. Uh, they changed the way people live. They changed their relationships. They changed, they went and said, you are sinners. Uh, and the consequences are, were that some societies were lost. The, the, the culture was destroyed uh, because, of the, what, because of what they were telling them. Uh, and so now we have more conscious um, missionaries who go in and speak the word, but don't try to change the culture necessarily. Uh, and that's very, very important. But what you say could have good consequences or bad consequences. You need to think about that before you see it. Um, lastly, uh, you need to preserve the rights of yourself whenever you're communicating, preserve your own rights, and preserve the rights of the other person. You preserve your own rights by not giving away your power to other people. You preserve your own rights by preserving your ability to make decisions. And then with others, the same thing. If you want to be an ethical communicator, you always preserve the right to make choices. Uh, when my kids were young, uh, I know when I grew up, I could never pick my clothes or my shoes. Even until I was about 17, I was making my own clothes. My mother always chose. And, you know, when you're 14, 15, and 16, you ought to be able to choose. But I wasn't. So I decided to let my children have choice early. So when they were in kindergarten, started going to day, uh, in kindergarten, I would let them choose their own clothes. Now, sometimes they would come out with stripes and plaids, or they would come out with orange and purple. But, you know, they were five years old. Let them have choice. How can you start learning? So I preserved their right for choice. Um, you preserve the right for association. Uh, you don't necessarily tell people who they can be friends with unless the person is your child and you feel like the people they're with may be harmful. Um, you preserve their right to a language. We don't have the right to go up to people and say, well, you should speak only English if you're in America. Uh, you don't have the right to tell them what language to choose. Be very careful about that. And you don't, uh, and we want to always preserve the other person's self-esteem. We never talk to people uh, because that reduces their potential. When you beat them down with words and you beat them down with negativity, you reduce their potential. Uh, lastly, facilitate the growth of your own potential and the potential of other people. Facilitate the potential that's in a community. So let's go on to say in our, my conclusion that ethical behavior is a benefit to ourselves, it's a benefit to others, and it is a benefit to society. 
without these guidelines, we harm each other. Uh, we cause malaise uh, in the community, in the country, and that is an illness or dissatisfaction in society. It reduces the sustainability of our community. A social sustainability has to do with living today in such a way that most people have the resources that they need to be well in our ways, but making decisions today so that our children in the future generations will also have those same resources. That's sustainable. People always say, what is social sustainability? It's the things that we do to help our community survive and to spread that through as many people as possible. Uh, check out your own communication. I hope you will do that today to, to determine if you have preserved your rights and the rights of yourself and the rights of others. And you always have to be sure that you don't give away your power in terms of your ability to communicate. We need to facilitate the growth of our own potential. Uh, how do you do that? Well, not uh, you uh, preserve your own potential by not saying negative things to yourself or about yourself uh, on a constant basis. You certainly can be uh, in, in reality about who you are, uh, but don't let don't down yourself. So. Um, what I'm trying to talk about today uh, is included on a PowerPoint that will be uh, available right at the bottom of this video. Simply click on the link. I thank you for being here today and listening to uh, my talk on ethics. My greatest wish is that you will take this, these uh, things and think about them and go out and talk with other people. Talk to your children about ethics. Talk to your friends. Talk about it at work because we can improve our relationships through ethical communication. Uh, this is Dr. B.